You were actually, um, I think, the one of the first people we were introduced to in terms of Indian classical music. Uh, yeah. And so that that being our introduction, as you saw our reactions, it was kind of just like a uh, punch to the face of like, whoa. <laughs> so that was yeah. uh, quite, quite impressive. But how are you? Uh, how are you holding up during uh, the, uh, the quarantine? Uh, yeah, actually, um, yeah, it, it's it's tough. It's tough to uh, it's mentally more uh, challenging, I guess, to accept mm -hmm. it. Start with. Yeah. And, um, you know, we are a family of three. I have an 11-year-old child who was, uh, who was supposed to go to the sixth standard in school. So he was looking forward to it, things that were coming up. Mm -hmm. So all that is suspended and we don't know for how long. Yeah. So that becomes a little challenging. I mean, he hasn't, poor thing, he hasn't seen another kid of his age in the longest time. Oof. So yeah, that That's becomes tough. really lonely, and he's he's stuck with us. We're trying <laughs> uh, we're trying to be eleven years old as much as possible in parts, but as we are also in our own thing, and sometimes there's a little bit of work, some things which are piled up, some things that we can do online, like long distance calls and meetings like that. Yeah. So he sometimes is a little lonely, and you know all that. And uh, I think the uncertainty is what is uh, mentally more uh, challenging to handle, to be very honest. Yeah, absolutely. Especially being a kid and not being able to be with other kids your age, it's, it's so difficult. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm here with my, but he's five months old. So he's not, uh, he's not really playing with anybody else right now except for us. So, um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but yeah, you were, like I was saying, you were actually one of the first people we were introduced to in terms of Indian classical music. And so we, we really appreciate you and your talent uh, that you have. Uh, I think the first question um, I had after we watched it was just how. And so can you answer that for me? <laughs> 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 but how will take you back? I think around uh, a little more than thirty years, because it um, one of the very essential things is, I think, I mean, according to me, would be um, to start very early mm -hmm. for different reasons. One is this is this is not an external instrument. This is an internal instrument that you can't see. So when you're dealing with your voice, when you're dealing with an external instrument, somebody can see if your fingering is wrong, if your techniques are wrong, if you're putting your fingers in the wrong place, in the wrong order, in the wrong sequence, someone externally can see that. Mm -hmm. But in a voice, if you're projecting your voice in a way which is limiting the possibility that will only happen 10 years later, mm. you know, the the, the complexities of the notes that we sing, the octaves that we sing, at least two and a half to three octaves that we sing with a natural voice, with no different chest register, head register, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. spontaneous, uh, one voice. Just the control of breathing it what is what is most important. And all these functionings are happening internally that somebody from outside cannot really see and you can't check it for yourself. So if it starts very early, then your voice gets into the grid in the right way in the right time. Hmm. Wow. So once the grid is right, once the placement of your voice and the sources are taken care of, then the possibilities are more. I wouldn't say limitless because, you know, that's a very abstract idea for me, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there are much more, I would say. So limitations are lesser, possibilities will expand. So that's one thing we'll have to start very, very early for the techniques to be right. Secondly, it's easier for a kid to listen to the teacher. As we grow up, we have our own questions, we have our own doubts, we have our own things that, okay, I've been told to practice the same ascending and descending maybe 500 times. Then as an adult, we first ask, why not 300 times? Mm -hmm. Why is 500 times such a magic word? What's wrong with 300 times? So the thing is, uh, 
but the shine and the clarity and the perfection that you will attain if you do it 500 times you will only get to know that if you have done 500 times so it's easier to to make a child do things the way the teacher wants and something that makes sure that the child if the child has the right talent and potential he or she gets to the right place to uh, to explore because the imaginative and the creative layer is added later first is is a uh, a bad grind i would say mm-hmm. for at least 10 years 8 to 10 years i would say is a it's it's absolutely unquestionable trust on your teacher and a bad grind so mm-hmm. once you've got those techniques right once you've got those uh, fundamentals right then you can forget about them because they've been taken care of by then and then you can think about the creativity and use those techniques as and when they are required because music at the end of the day is about emotion is about uh, the story that you're trying to say it's about the dynamics that you want to explore which in the process expresses a certain kind of an emotion but if you think about the techniques you will never be able to perform soulfully with all your emotions expressed in the right way so the techniques have to be learned and then forgotten about basically so you have to basically put them in a deeper layer and not consciously think of them anymore so what you're consciously doing you're actually concentrating on the emotional aspect of music and the techniques are there to support you whenever you want them to do whatever you want dang you're a teacher aren't you <laughs> dang it's very it's very wise just... <laughs> thank you yeah one of the things that was very evident um the very first reaction we ever had of listening and watching you sing um i were obviously extreme novices when it comes to indian music or eastern music um i have an understanding of music purely from a western mindset in terms of choral music or orchestral music or even just band music and they they have similarities but they also have extraordinary differences <laughs> one of the things that i immediately picked up on was and i said this in our reaction was the amount of hours of training that you had to have gone through in order to have done something multifaceted just the breathing alone Uh, I I truly I don't when we react we're really big on being genuine and and how we react. We won't say something unless we really believe it. And I remember when I heard you sing and my daughters were with us during that reaction mm-hmm. who are both singers. One Alexis specifically wants to have her career is singing. She's like got a pretty voice. She she wants to sing. I have never heard this is going to sound over grand but i mean this i've never heard a until i heard you i have never heard a human being do with the human voice what you are capable of doing with the human voice at every level in terms of diaphragmatic breathing to the control that you have with your tonality and being pitch perfect to the scales you can do without getting into a head voice and then you add to that what i'm beginning to learn about raga and this improvisational style that i only know like jazz and western music yes um it it truly truly is uh, an extraordinary thing to behold and it's one of the questions we had was uh, how much because training is obviously critical crucial as you said it needs to start young how much do you see this is a result where you presently are now with this uh, artistry you can do how much of that is is innate god given gifting that you have and how much of it do you think and i don't know that you can delineate this how much of it is is the the training per se does that make sense yes it does uh, but as you rightly said it's difficult for me to say that because you know uh i am a result or any musician for that matter 
is a result of the process which is a perfect marriage of these two yeah which is great marriage of what you're born with and what you've done with that gift and of course your uh, circumstances your environment your influences your teachers their impact on your life so mm-hmm. everything put together so it's very difficult for the student like i am it's very difficult for me to say that what had a greater impact in my music mm-hmm. but i would say that uh, along with the musical gift another gift is also a frame of mind that is also a very very important gift why i'm saying this because i've seen talented uh, youngsters who are born with fantastic voices so that's genuinely the the most uh, relevant gift that we can talk about but what happens if your commitment and you know any grind is is very tedious on your system on your mind it starts from your mind because that's where the fatigue starts and then that reflects in what you're doing so that fatigue with lot of talented gifted youngsters i've seen i've i've seen this that they're extremely gifted but the perseverance the commitment the the constant tussle that you have to do with yourself to continue with that stringent uh, you know um, routine of yours and discipline of yours for years and this is not weeks and months we are talking about and these are years which are very very uh, crucial in terms of you want to enjoy life at that time you want to do things you want to go out be with friends go to you know movies and you know have night outs and do party and do all sorts of things and late nights and you know laugh your heart out and scream but that's the time when the most crucial things happen in your life so it's also making a choice to kind of separating yourself from whatever is so tempting for that age and to commit yourself to something which you have to believe without seeing the result that eventually it will give you the result mm-hmm. Well so that perseverance <laughs> itself is also a gift. A gift, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that mindset is also a gift. Of course music is the gift, but for you to bring that shine that you want is also a gift that has to come with the uh, with the gift of music and voice for a musician to actually go to that point because let's say you've enjoyed your life till your 20 and then you're ready to do that uh take that grind or take that path but it doesn't have the same result mm. right so well, what you can do from the age of 10 to 20 you can't do from the age of 20 to 30 though mathematically these are 10 years but because it's the most formative years your system your body your mind learns the most in those years mm-hmm. so you have to teach your mind you have to teach your voice you have to teach your mindset you have to teach your brain to concentrate on different things to multitask at the same time think of the words the tempo the beat the notes the pitch the perfection the presentation the ease and last but never the least the aesthetics the dynamics the the emotions so you have to teach everything to yourself in those 10 to 15 years and if you're not ready to do that at that time then your brain has learned so much otherwise that for you to undo a lot of that and to again relearn a lot of basics and fundamentals to become the musician that you want to become becomes difficult if it's late mm. yeah mm. on that so that is and also i will sorry but no, i no, haven't no, <laughs> no please go to the uh, the training bit so the training also um you know in indian music system and when i'm saying indian music system especially in the context of training i would like to mention one thing that for this we have very uh, unique disciplines coming from the northern part of india and southern part of india we call it hindustani and carnatic music you might know so the training systems are very different the carnatic training system is 
is systematic it's bound it's structured much more than our system the hindustani system is very subjective because it's not composition based it's creativity based so when it comes to creativity it naturally becomes because creativity cannot be objective creativity it has to be subjective creativity your imagination is your imagination not mine so that is why the training process is also very subjective mm-hmm. and a guru or a performer or a teacher he or she devises his own uh, universe and elements that he wants to teach his or her students so his training system would be of a certain kind why gharana is uh, so important in hindustani system gharana is nothing but a family so there's a biological family there's a musical family so a gharana is a family bound by music and the head of the family that gharana has devised a certain style of singing for which he or she teaches certain elements so teaching system is also very different so you might hear music from i belong to the patiala kasur gharana loosely in this time and era it's difficult to say that uh, i only follow that one system because uh, i get to hear so many different kinds of music and i'm sure my mind is uh, you know is absorbing some of it even when i'm not conscious of it so the influences of which might show in my music but at the time when gharanas were made then communication and traveling was not that easy even within our country so the gharanas were much stricter in their own system but now if you even now if you hear somebody singing from a gwalior gharana or somebody singing from um uh let's say uh jaipur gharana so their unfolding of their style of music will be very different mm. but there are certain commonalities certain differences so as far as training process is concerned i think i have been blessed by such a scientific analytical training process that was devised predominantly by my father's guru and who's also my guru guru gyan prakash ghosh ji and my father of course who has been my primary teacher my parents my mother and my father mm. so this training system itself is also a great uh, uh, i would say an instrument which gives me which empowers me with uh, the technical brilliance that uh, is otherwise very difficult to attain just by copying so certain basic rules have to be learned and practiced for uh, for eventually to attain certain ease within the very complex movements mm-hmm. so as an artist i i think you would agree that what uh, impresses the audience first is the ease of an artist absolutely 100% so my father has a very uh, very simple way of saying that he says that we can have uh, musical laborers and we have artists so putting a lot of effort and making something is labor and the effort shows the difficulty shows the in your face in your expression in your body language what shows is that you're doing something very difficult that's not artistry artistry is when you're doing something hugely difficult and complex but it's not showing in in your body language in your voice yes what people see is you enjoy doing that and that's what attracts the audience because in the audience i really can't expect in hundreds and thousands of people everyone to understand what complexities i'm doing yeah, but that- what they will understand and what they will what will be the connection between the audience and the and the singer is the happiness mm-hmm. is the enjoyment that makes a lot of sense we interviewed and got to watch uh, ustad ji zakir hussain um I know. in in, I've in a concert and one of the first questions that. we had for him well that I had for him I asked him I said it looked like you're not even thinking when you're when you're yeah. doing these complicated uh things on the <laughs> tabla and it just looks like you're just kind of freely doing it but it's the most insane thing I've ever heard and so yeah I 100% Absolutely. agree it's the effortlessness 
uh, even in acting, like Irfan Khan is just effortless in his acting, you, and it's just so impressive uh, that way. But I did want to ask, I know you started training from a really early age, probably two years old, around that, but when did I you I mean, know as soon as I could talk and I could make sound with my voice, I think my parents were just waiting for that time. <laughs> when, when, did, when did you know that you wanted to dedicate your life to music, or was that always a foregone conclusion for you? I never knew it just happened. Gotcha. It just happened so uh, spontaneously. And it was so organic that the, as if the decision was made beforehand, mm -hmm. like before anything could have been decided. Mm -hmm. I, and that is why it might sound a little heavy for, uh, for the age group that we belong to. But I, I always say that I didn't choose music. I think music chose me mm -hmm. before I had the power of choosing anything for myself or even my family yeah. um, I think uh, every uh, I believe that every life is born with a very very unique special purpose sometimes it takes time for the purpose to reveal but in my case I've been very very lucky that the purpose brought me to uh, I mean put things into context I never had to do anything so it, it wasn't my decision or my parents' decision or whatever it is. And it's not something that otherwise would have happened in my family because I have a younger brother who's more than 10 years younger than me. He doesn't sing. He's not a singer. So it's not like a given thing that anybody in the family would have become a singer. Mm -hmm. So that's not a thing. But in my case, I never had a hobby. I always wanted to sing as, as my pastime. So everything was around music. I enjoyed singing more than anything else. Um, even as a child, this is funny, but I would like to mention this because I think it makes sense when you talk about childhood uh, because we don't have conscious memories of all the things. Uh, my name is, I mean, it is a little long for a very small child to remember with the spelling and everything. So my mother was trying before I was admitted uh, into a school or a preschool, something like that. She was trying to teach me the spelling of my name. And of course, I was not being able to remember it because it's just long. So she made a song and that's <clears throat> how I learned the spelling of my name. So she that's made awesome. K -A -U -S -H -I -K -I -K so that's how I learned the name. That's awesome. Even my name and spelling of it, I learned through a music. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Now, uh, one of the things I've noticed about, even as you've just been expressing yourself, uh, it's my understanding that you have a, is it true, you have a master's degree in philosophy? I do, yes. Yeah, okay. And what I've discovered, even as you've been talking, and as well as oh, the, the limited exposure we've had to Indian music, one of the differences, obviously, in the just scale and modality between Eastern and Western music is that in Western music, there seems to be an accentuation, rightly so, on discipline and rehearsal and performance and the aesthetic of enjoying it on a uh, artistic level. But I'd love to know, uh, is one of the reasons you pursued a master's degree in philosophy because what I see is that uh, Indian musicians, whether it's a tabla player or a singer, have this really holistic approach to artistry that really incorporates humanities and philosophy and spirituality. So does it, for you, did philosophy just kind of just go hand in hand with your artistry? Uh, yeah, it, it did. And that's why I wanted to do my uh, master's because, you know, my father was dead against uh, uh, me studying any further because he was thinking that a lot of time is being given to education because I was studying seriously because I simply because I loved the subject. So I was studying really seriously. So he was thinking that, you know, it's time I'm borrowing time from music and doing other mm -hmm. things that I will never need that degree. I mean, I'm not becoming a professor or doing something right, like that. Right. So he was thinking that as simple as you're just wasting wasting time studying too much. Why do you need to study philosophy and why do you need to do your graduations and your bachelors and masters and why do you want to go to the best uh, possible university to study because they have semester system which means that much more pressure, that mm -hmm. much you know uh, time given for study, so all that. But uh, I think it's very weird that how 
Indian music and Indian philosophy and Indian spirituality, not religion, spirituality, is very, very, very closely bonded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you have uh, the, the piece of music that you have uh, reviewed and given feedback to is a very fast paced uh, portion of a performance. But if you listen to the longer uh, presentation of an Indian drug, you will know that the ratio of slower movement is to faster movement is perhaps five is to one time wise. Mm. If a performance is of 40 minutes, 10 minutes will be faster movements. Mm. So the first 10 to 15, 20 minutes will be very, very, very slow. And that is what gives us the power to go fast. So people think that the faster movements are the more difficult ones. But uh, the most difficult one, the part that is most difficult in an Indian music performance is the slower movement is where it starts. I'll tell you the most difficult note that I personally have ever sung in a performance is the first sa mm. of a performance. So you always think that first sa will shake, you will be out of breath. There'll be something, there'll be uh, something in your voice which will distort it. So the first sa is so important. Why? Because it's the root. It's mm. from where music is going to blossom. And spiritually thinking, I think the most magical moment in a performance is the absolute silence, the moment before you start singing. Because that's kind of the womb of the of the entire performance. That's where it all comes out of. Because uh, in Indian music, in Indian classical music, to be very specific, we have preparation, but we don't have rehearsals. Huh. There's a slight difference. Interesting. I, yeah. So I I think, um, I mean, of course, this is not my mother tongue, but I think there's a slight difference in how we understand rehearsal and how we understand preparation. I'm prepared for the performance, but I couldn't have rehearsed because I don't know what I'm going to sing on stage. Well, yeah, Secure. for Hindustani music, uh, 100% compared to Carnatic so music, it's correct? 100%. Uh, it's... 98% spontaneous and creative. Why I'm right. preserving 2% because we have two and two lines, four lines of a composition. That's all is composed. Everything else is on the spot, impromptu. And trust me, there are mistakes. There are approximations sometimes, but that's human. That's natural. That's how nature is. You can't really expect every leaf of a tree to be same size and dimension. It will be a boring tree. You would never take a picture of that flower whose petals are exactly same size. Mm. So it's true. So that Mm. one moment of silence before you start your performance, Mm. that is what is spiritual. That is what is very, very important in music and in the creative process that you are entering into. So that's a moment of prayer if you may want to call it. That's a moment of meditation, if you want to call it. That's a moment of truth, if you want to call it. That's a moment of purity, if you want to call it. And then, uh, this is from a spiritual point of view. And practically thinking, our music, the most important note of our music is the Sa. So Sa is where... uh, the entire music, the process starts from and in the end of the music with all the fast, slow tempos, complexities, notes, up and down, all sorts of uh, charisma that you want to show in a performance, you come back and end your performance in the sa. So the entire process is very cyclic. Similarly, our rhythm cycle is also cyclic, it's not linear. Mm So you've spoken to Stadji, I'm sure he has uh, he's mentioned this, that even if it's a 10-beat cycle, a 16-beat cycle, a 6-beat cycle, you always come back to one. And how beautifully you create that anticipation for that one to come 
is the most beautiful process in our music so that principle of one in terms of melody and rhythm is very similar to indian spirituality mm. because for us this entire creation starts from brahma which is an abstract concept so brahma is not a god with number of heads and number of hands and number of weapons and number of you know adjectives brahma brahma is different but brahma is a abstract concept which uh, this is a very philosophy student talking but uh, brahma is a very abstract mm. concept which cannot be qualified by any adjective mm. so for me as a musician if i try to think of what is the obvious connection the silence that i was talking about the moment silence before you start is the brahma for us mm. Mm. it's not qualified by an adjective because it's silence but it has all the possibilities that will happen after the silence so it has all the qualities but you can't really define it with one quality and not the other gotcha and so you- i think this way of uh, philosophy spirituality and music in indian context is basically different perspectives of the same thing right yeah i'd like to ask you um i've asked this of everybody we've interviewed um because they're all at such a level but i'd be really interested to see what you say since you're a philosophy student um <laughs> Do you consider yourself a master of what you do and also do you think if if not do you think people can be masters? No. No. Mm-hmm. Why? No. <laughs> Because I think uh, if you think that XYZ is a master I think uh that's the biggest proof that XYZ thinks of himself or herself mm. as a student that is ready to learn so much more. Gotcha. that makes sense mm-hmm. being a musician in other people's uh, view is an assurance to me that i'm a good student which means i have so much more to learn you know what do you feel like you have still yet to learn everything <laughs> everything because you know uh uh how do i put it there are dimensions that that we don't see but which adds very um significant but not tangible layers to your art mm-hmm. i'm not talking about the craft the craft is different i'm talking about the art i'm talking about the origin of my music i need to evolve there not a taan which is in more speed a sargam a note combination that is more complex there's a limit to that because i'm not a machine i'm a human being i will have my limits like physical limits human limits but because i'm a human the source can be enhanced to a point which is limitless mm-hmm. so that is why i'm not thinking in terms of the craft i'm thinking in terms of the art because uh, i'll try to put it in a easier way you know we hear the what of music what i'm singing i'm singing a composition i'm singing a sargam i'm singing a taan i'm singing a bandish i'm singing a vistar i'm singing khatka alankar all that i mean these are all technical terms of different movements musical movements so these are the what of music but there's a why of music <laughs> so there's a limitless possibility of growth in the why and that is why i consider myself a student that is ready to explore more and more into the why of music that's beautiful that's why i'll never be a master <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't surprise us that that was your answer because no. when i use that when i use that terminology with the stadi zakir hussain he not only answered it in a similar fashion but he forever erased from my mindset the description of an artist as being a master because 
from his vantage point, he said he doesn't consider what he does with the tabla to be something he can master as if it was his slave. He considers it a partnership where the tabla itself allows him to participate in the artistry together. Absolutely. So it's, it's not a surprise that your your answer was, was comparable. And Corbin alluded to this a little while ago that your um, articulations are not only so uh, intelligent and insightful, but they truly are uh, seemingly from the heart of a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, for example, I know you have your the nonprofit, chari <laughs> the nonprofit charitable trust that you have, the Soul Voice Aspiration. Yes. yes. Do you, I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, especially in light of the fact, do you, do you also, um, do you teach in addition to what you do with your performing? Do you teach? No, I, 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 I don't. Not as yet. And that's a very practical problem of time, of time management. Because sure. it's not easy to be a professional traveling musician and with a family, with a small child. And, you know, the practical demands of lives are too much. And uh, with kids, I mean, you will know that with kids, uh, the father being away is still a little manageable, but the mother being away becomes a very touchy thing in different phases of their lives. Uh -huh. True. So, uh, so when I'm home, I try to be there for home, not just being at home, but busy otherwise. So um, for that, when I'm traveling, I'm anyway absent. I try my best. We all try uh, with the huge burden of mother's guilt. We all try to be there as much as possible for everything. But uh, when I'm not there, I'm not there. It's just as simple as that. But when I'm there, if I try and because teaching is also for me, it's like, a, um, you know, I learned from my father, I didn't go to a teacher once a week, paid him a fee. So it was not a functioning for me. It was like a mode of life for me. So if I teach, I can't go into the functional processing of teaching. You know what I mean? This once a week yes. I give you a lesson, you prepare that, come back next week. And in the bit in between you might have lost a lot of time practicing it the wrong way, which means another two weeks will be gone undoing that. I can't mm -hmm. leave my students like that. It's a huge responsibility for me. Mm -hmm. And at the moment I don't have the time to take that uh, responsibility into my shoulders. I already have too much on the plate. Sure. Understandable. But I'm, uh, <laughs> I would love to uh, uh, eventually, uh, I would love to uh, teach a couple of students, maybe a very small number, handful of students. Why? You know, because I often see on social media and my mails and everywhere where people try to communicate with me, they send me uh, music, their own singing, which are mere copy paste versions of what I sing in a performance mm. and what I fear is that if they keep on copying me and rep trying to replicate that their identity of who they are coming across in their music will never be a possibility mm -hmm. they will suffer on that and some of them are so talented that I'll feel very very bad if they don't get their own expression mm -hmm. and if just help them to to find their own expression. So I, that is a very kind of an inner compulsion that I've been feeling uh, lately. So I don't know what the selection process can be and I'll have to be very, very strict in selecting only very, very handful of uh, music students or musicians, so to say. But that is something that, uh, because I'm not too sure how much time that will demand, I'm not just sure. getting into being in a, a little safe, I would say, honestly, sure. because I don't know how demanding that can be. Yeah, sure. I, Understandable. I find, I find that's pretty uh, similar with all artists, especially at the beginning when you're training a lot, like uh, if you're training with somebody like uh, yourself or like in acting, we talked about this with Nawaz, like when you're training you and you, you're, you're young, you try to emulate your favorite actors. And so yeah. like yeah. He, he once said he, he did something uh, similar to like an Al Pacino scene, but he did it as Al Pacino. Or did, that, was that you or him, exactly. Rick? 
It, w- it was actually both of oh, us, both, and yeah. we had a commonality we joked about. Was we had both done the exact same thing with Al yeah. Pacino. <laughs> before, you can, before you actually find your own voice, you, you try to emulate yeah. people that you look up to uh, until exactly. you get a little older and wiser and find your, your own uh, voice in whatever artistry you're performing. Uh, but yeah, so I find that's pretty similar. But uh, this has been incredibly insightful, but I want to f- kind of almost finish it up with almost a rapid fire for a bunch of almost silly questions. Sometimes oh, they're not really, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> just uh, answer as best you can. You don't have to, um, but uh, first one is coffee or chai? Chai, of course. Black tea, Darjeeling, second flush. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Go ahead. go ahead. Okay. No, no, you go. You okay, go, gotcha. You go. Favorite Indian instrument? Sarangi. Which one's that? Sarangi is the one uh, uh, which you, you put it like that and play it, with it, the bow. We've seen you in a video yeah. playing it, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. It, you're you playing have, it. You'll it, find plenty of them in my videos. Uh, I just love that the sound of that instrument. Uh, if you look up... Uh, in the YouTube, you'll find somebody called Murad Ali Khan. He's incredible. He's incredible. Oh, Just God. listen to him. And he's so soulful. That's one thing I really, really, it touches me because, you know, technically brilliant, uh, very fast, very complex. That's amazing. But something that you cannot have unless you are born with it, unless you're gifted with it, mm-hmm. is is the soul. And I find that a lot in Murad Ali Khan Sahib Sarangi. So Sarangi is one of my very, very favorite instruments. How, how many instruments can you play? I can play the harmonium and I can play the tabla while I sing because I was taught to play the tabla and sing with it. So basically I can play the tabla, I, I can play everything that is played on a tabla when I sing, while I'm singing. Mm. Uh, so I can play that as the cycles and everything because I, it's basic it's not like wow tabla playing but basic but i can keep the tempo and keep the cycle going and while i sing sure that's who's your nothing favorite, much who, who's your favorite american singer uh Celine Dion at one point of time after titanic of course i think yeah. the entire generation just loved her <laughs> and then adele and uh katie Perry. mm-hmm I just love, love their voices. Love Katie. Uh, favorite thing about making music? Peace mm. and honesty. Because I don't think I can be as pure and honest in any of my other expressions apart from music. Least favorite thing about making music? Selfies. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, favorite Hollywood film? Um, uh, 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 uh. Uh, can I say something which is old? Yeah, of course. Bridges of Madison County. I've never seen that Absolutely. one. Who's in that? Meryl Streep and Clint Eastwood. Yeah. <laughs> Who are they? Uh, <laughs> uh, favorite. Uh, very old, but. Meryl Streep is, I think my husband is ready to marry her at any given point. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl Streep is fantastic. And I don't mind. As long as she comes home, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> favorite Indian film? Uh, favorite Indian film? Um, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, that was not rapid at all. No worries. Um, That's just fine. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to name those uh, Dabang Salman Khan types movies. No offense, but I don't like them. That's uh, okay. I, I, uh, among the recent ones, I've liked something which is called uh, Section 375 and one which is Chapak, which is Deepika Padukone, which is on acid yeah, attacks. We saw Chapak. Yep. It, was, it was fantastic. Uh, favorite uh, Indian, uh, no, favorite Indian actor, male or female, doesn't matter. Kamal Hassan at one point in time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ranveer Singh at the moment mm-hmm. he's incredible yes he is uh, favorite ho- favorite Hollywood actor uh, Meryl Streep I think makes sense uh, favorite food home food and uh, Thai food 
Mm. And last one, favorite thing to drink? Uh, Tea is one of my most favorite things to Mm. drink. And apart from that, I think uh, virgin mojito. The which one? Virgin mojito. Mojito? Yeah. Oh, yummy. I love mojito. I used to be a I used to be a bartender. Mm-hmm. Making mojitos is fun. Uh, so oh. that, that was it. Thank you so much. I really yeah. I will. Thank you so much for for sitting down with us. It's been one. Uh, you're incredibly intelligent and well spoken. Uh, you could tell you're a philosophy student and also just an intelligent person uh, with that, with how 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 well you speak. And obviously, we know you're. I can say you're a master because I'm not you. Uh, I believe you are a master at what you do because you're, you're so talented. Uh, but so thank you so much for sitting down with us, Rick. I don't know if you want to say something. But yeah, yeah. I, thank, thank you, you so much. Go ahead, Rick. No, I, all I wanted to say in closing was for all of you stupid babies out there watching and uh, please visit her website. It is her name. Uh, all you have to do is a Google search or just go straight to her website of kushikichakoborty.com and take a look at things that are on there, especially the nonprofit charitable trust, because uh, I hope it makes you happy to know. I read that one of the things that matters most to you is to see uh, the, the world become more understanding of not just Hindustani music, but all forms of classical music you even have some things in here that you want to encourage uh, people in all forms of music including western and that passion is so evident in how you express yourself and i'll I'll tell you the exposure we had with astaji zakir hussein and with yourself have caused us to not only appreciate at a wider level but want to learn more about indian artistry and specifically all of this beautiful, brand new to us in the past year world of Indian thank classical so much. music. So thank you. Thank you all that, you know, the two names that you've been uh, taking in the same breath is the biggest award of my life. Ustaji is is my God. He's, he's the God <laughs> of this entire uh, Indian music, uh, this entire, uh, you know, human uh, population who are aware of the word. Indian music. He's yeah. he's been he's been personally he's been my north star. I first met him when I was three years old, thanks to my father. Oh wow! Mm. And he has been such a father figure, and his his affection, his guidance, his love has been one of the most, you know, one of the most treasured blessings of my life. And to be uh, even mentioned in the same breath as him is mm. is one of the biggest, you know presents, gifts and awards that I could ever have won in my life. And uh, I'm very, very happy that you're making such an amazing effort and, uh, you know, doing this for Indian music is uh, is something that as a student of Indian music, I would really like to thank you for doing this because I think it makes a lot of difference. It, uh, you know, people who don't identify with Indian culture, Indian music, Indian tradition, but they understand you and they follow you and they relate to your way of upbringing, your culture, your way of thinking, your way of looking at life. When you talk about a certain kind of a music, they relate much more. And that is such a great service done to our music. And and I think music is the, is the biggest positive uh, uh, you know, force in this world that can, you know, forces are different. They sometimes take us far away from each other. But this is one force which binds us together in such a lovely way that it's a bonding that we all treasure. So I'm really, really thankful as as a student of Indian music that you're doing this for our music. Thank it's you so honor. much. That was it really, that was Thank really you. kind of you. And now it is one of my dreams to, once all this uh, coronavirus is over, to see a concert with you and Ustaji Zakir Hussain at, oh <laughs> at one time, <laughs> oh, that would be a dream. Uh, do you ever come to uh, uh, Los Angeles to perform? Yes, I was about to be in Los Angeles on the 16th of uh, May. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's upsetting. 
please uh, i was i i was supposed to have a master class um uh, at the ucla for 3 days oh. and you will be very very surprised that as a as a young uh, <sighs> student i wanted to study at the ucla but of course my father wouldn't allow me to go <laughs> to us because it's going away from his discipline and doing 9 to 10 hours of practice a day which you know he campus. Have, so i wanted to <laughs> study there but i was called for a master class and i was like yeah finally i go to ucla and i wanted to stay in the campus i told them i don't want a hotel nothing i want to still stay oh, in the no, campus it's beautiful there like, yeah You know, I am there at the UCLA was like the dream come true. <laughs> But yes, fingers crossed. I'm sure all that will happen, and yeah. I'm very, very sure of it. I'm, I'm hoping you come back. Wonderful. So thank you so yeah. much. We um, really, really appreciate thank it. You. Thank stay, you. Thank you. Stay safe. God bless you and your yeah. family. Thank and you. we look forward when this is all done. We're going to keep tabs on everything that you're doing, and we just deeply appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Take okay. care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Lovely to meet you.